Hello, everyone, and welcome to Answer Everywhere. Today, we're taking a look at Adventure Game Studio, which is a game engine toolkit that allows you to build adventure games, like the classic point and click graphical adventure games um, that were cool many years ago, maybe like the 90s, late 80s, um, and have sort of evolved into other genres. Um, but Adventure Game Studio, I think, is squarely made at kind of making some of these retro games. I posted a video last week of um, my brother and I trying to play through what might be considered kind of a modern version of one of these games, which is called Disco Elysium. And the idea there is that's just a, a story based uh, game that is a little bit, you know, from on this channel, we're looking at how things are made, how things are created uh, software so far. But there are other sorts of things that you can create. And one of them is like films or movies or stories. And I think adventure games are kind of um, the genre that's that's like an interactive story. Kind, not quite a film, um, but definitely in the video game camp, but using kind of more film um, elements where they, the idea is that the user gets to interact and evolve through the story as things go on. So. Um, you can hear some screenshots of what Adventure Game Studio looks like. And I guess if I click on them, they go away. But uh, you can see that it's a relatively, to my eyes, older looking uh, UI. Um, maybe like an old version of Windows. I don't, I haven't used enough Windows to know kind of what era this was. Um, but um, I think there should be, uh, I think that the, the uh, because this is focused on creating this specific sort of game, I think this will, this will give us an appreciation for the logic of these games more than simply looking at um, a, a more general purpose game engine that allows you to make other sorts of games, among some of which are, are adventure games. All right, so that being said, let's jump in. Um, here's the code base on GitHub. And uh, one thing that I see that's a little bit I'm not sure how to, to handle it or think of it, is that we have a mix of C++ and C, which on its own is not so surprising. But then we also have C Sharp, and we have like 17% C Sharp. And then we have Java, which is, I kind of think of C Sharp as Microsoft's attempt to, to make a Java clone. Um, and so C Sharp and Java are kind of similar, but they require different VMs. So I'm not really sure what's going on with all of these different languages, where they fit in. Maybe one is maybe one is for scripting, and the others are implementations. I don't know. Um, in fact, why don't we check out Adventure Game Studio scripting? We have an introduction to scripting, part one. All of the interactivity in the game is handled using scripts. So this is um, this is an interesting and important point. Point I guess that we I'm glad that we look uh, see it early, which is that. If we take this sentence literally, um, this means that there's no um, like game logic interactivity that's handled uh, outside of the scripting system. So when you're creating, I guess, a, a game using Adventure Game Studio, it's really all about writing the scripts, and you're not going to be having to toy with um, with any of the rest of the engine that might be implemented in other languages. Um, assuming you've done the main AG AGS tutorial which I haven't. You create a script that looks like this. So this looks like a C-based language, language, possibly C-sharp. Um, but let's see if we can find the, uh, the tutorial. Or what language does Adventure Game Studio use for scripting? Let's ask Google, because Google tends to be a little bit better. All right, the script based on the C. So maybe this is a custom language. Well, we'll find out. Let me look at the code. I think I was looking at GitHub, um, but I guess there's no real reason to. Let's look at Emacs. All right, so in the root directory, we see a few things. One is editor. This is going to be some, some sort of editor. I don't know of what. Probably of, I'm going to guess, just to throw something out there, of worlds, like um, of 2D graphics. Um, Let's see if I can find it. it, it editing world in Adventure Game Studio. Let's see if I can find a um, like an image of what it looks like when you're using like the uh, 
I think something like this, where you have um, some essentially some image in the background, and you're going to like select areas of the screen, like you would select rec rectangles for these doors, and mark them somehow as the, this is an element that the user is going to interact with, such as by opening. So I think that that's probably the sort of stuff that's going on in the editor. We'll see the engine is presumably going to be the game engine. Live source is a pretty generically named, but this could be my first thought is maybe that this is uh, lib source is essentially vendor dependencies. We have download and tar extract. Yeah, I think that this is vendor dependencies like Vorbis. Okay. Script is presumably going to be scripting support solutions. That's not like a directory named by like a business consultant, but um, are these solutions to puzzles? Engine solution? Yeah, I don't know. So we'll take a look at all market. I'll make sure to visit it. Plugins and PSP. I would guess that a lot of the functionality might be built in plugins, but who knows? It kind of depends on how robust the ecosystem is. So for example, we see Lua. Presumably this is a plugin to, to um, uh, allow you to write scripts in Lua. Let's see if we can find out and find any comments. Yeah, I don't know. But we do see here uh, the something about the um, the plugin system, which is that this is a C file, and we have these these um, these functions module start and module stop. I'm going to guess that these are called by the plugin engine, but um, we don't know for sure yet. And then we have flashlight. Blend, I'm not sure what blend would be. Parallax is presumably support for like visual parallax. And then stuff about sprites and rain and that sort of thing. PSP, I'm not sure. We have a kernel, a launcher, a lib media malloc. So PSP kind of seems like the kind of the game, the gameplay area. Let's see if we get like any, any sort of comment in kernel. Not in there. PSP module and go. Is PSP um, a piece of hardware that it's supporting? Because we saw OS X, AGS engine, PSP support. Is this PlayStation? I'm going to guess. Oh, or is this the, um, this is the portable, PlayStation portable? Yeah, OK. I think that this is probably support. <laughs> I think I clicked on the wrong thing. I think this is probably support for the, the PlayStation Portable um, thingamajig. You get a, a picture of it. This thing. I'm going to guess that's what's going on in PSP directory and ignore it. Yes. And we also have OSX, which is an iOS, which are going to be like hardware or, or platform dependent parts of Adventure Game Studio. Mscripten is the uh, JavaScript standard, essentially. I'm, I don't know what we're doing with JavaScript, but it doesn't seem like a lot. The install dependencies, launcher window, my game file.js. Tilt this array with all your game files and put them in the same location. So possibly this lets you play the game um, in your browser. I'm not sure. But we'll, I guess, ignore that as well. And then we have common and compiler. CI and CMake are going to be um, continuous integration for CI, and CMake will just be build stuff, so we'll ignore them. Android will also ignore. And then common and compiler, how big is common? Common's got a lot of stuff, so I guess we should look at it. And the compiler, who knows? Compiler.h. The script compiler core. Okay, so this is the compiler for the script which is good to know where that is. I'll flag like it as well. And given what we have, common compiler, editor, engine, script, and solutions. I'm kind of most curious about solutions, just because I don't know what it is, but I'm going to start in common. And I guess let's start in core. And in core, we have asset, asset managers and types. So um, let's start in 
asset, I guess. Asset info and asset lib info. Class describing generic asset library. So I'm guessing by, I don't know if the word library is doing any work. I'm guessing these are just describing generic assets. So an asset info has a file name, an ID, basically a unique ID, an offset, which is, I guess we're going to store um, the, the file store. It will basically be serializing one asset after another in bytes, and then we just store in some sort of index, maybe, um, what, like what the, what the offset of that of the byte array is. And then, then we have the, the asset size and bytes. Okay, so that's straightforward. And we have asset lib info. And we have a base path, a base store, and a base file. And I assume this is um, like, you know, you open up Adventure Game Studio, and it'll basically ask you where do you want the root of your project to be, and that's the sort of stuff um, stored here. And hello, folks, on the chat. Um, it's not, not quite a game, but a tool for building games. And Dora was saying that, it probably, that I was probably right about PSP. I, yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so assets are straightforward. Um, it's basically where is your stuff, and then we're going to store, we're going to serialize everything and, and like uh, pump it into a single file. And then types should be basic type definitions. We've got this force inline macro, which is um, these aren't, I guess, varying a lot, but they. Do depend on whether you use, I guess, Microsoft or the GNU compiler. And then we have a fixed point type and a color type in, in a Noom that has like a, I guess, we're going to frequently shift by 16. And then we're setting K unit to, um, I guess, one left shift and then K shift, which is 16. What, it's, what that's doing, I have no idea. Um, so core, there's not, there's not a lot in core. We have platform, which I will ignore, and depth version, uh, which is just going to print version number, right? Copyright years, 2011 to 2023. Okay, there's not a lot there. Debug and font, I will ignore game. We have main game file, that's DPP, and main game file that age. I'm guessing these are just essentially uh, a software model of but like what the entry point for your game is. Then we have a room file base and a room file. I'm guessing this is the real thing is room file. And then we have like a some sort of base. Maybe they have a, a tree or some sort of structure where room files. Um, if you imagine the adventure game, like we just looked at that picture of the door. Is that still up? We have the PSP up. Um, unfortunately, this is not a high-res high graphic. But, um, you know, behind the store would be another room, which, as you're playing the game, the idea is to, to make it seem like this is another room in the same building or whatever. But uh, to, from the engine's perspective, there's just some graph, I imagine, of, um, of rooms. And then there's like a link between a, 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 um, an arc in the graph between one and, and one room and another, if they're connected in the sense that a player can walk from one to the other. So I'm guessing that's what room file is. But let's open these. Uh, maybe just the header. Room struct, I guess, let's look at. No idea what trough file is, but things that get abbreviated are sometimes important. And then interactions looks important. We'll look at the custom properties header. And we might as well look at main game file. That is, and let's start there. So 159 lines, not bad. And we've got some things that seem like options. Like is main game library, find game data. Now these, are, these are not options, these are functions with kind of a weird formatting. The function name is, is justified rather than being like a fixed number of spaces from the return type. Um, and we just got things like update game data, etc. These are rather, I guess, generic functions it looks like. Load game entities. So this is meant for keeping objects loaded from the game file. So this is going to look into the asset stuff that we can, that we saw, uh, kind of how to configure, uh, and load the files into some sort of vector, I assume. So we get a vector of scripts, a vector of plugins, a vector of dialogues, and a vector of views. 
I kind of want to know what a dialogue is. And then we have game source, which is uh, you basically have a name of the asset file and a version string, probably a description maybe somewhere where you compile it with. Maybe you don't have a description. Okay. Um, so let's look at a dialogue. We have dialogue scripts too. Dialogue topic. Okay. Dialogue topic is the type. So what folder are we in? Common slash AC. What is AC? This is this has things like audio, key code, sprites. No idea what AC stands for yet. If you have a sense of what AC might be, uh, let me know. Um, all right. Okay, so for dialogue topics, we have um, a list of options, essentially, looks like. Max topic options. Um, a list of flags, option flags. A, uh, a list of entry points. And startup entry point. I guess this is maybe the initial entry point. Whatever code size is, maybe just keeping the, the size of the uh, dialogue topics altogether, I don't know. And then the number of options and the number of topic flags. Okay. And then we have this um, vector of um, unit eight, which is called option scripts. Option scripts is an unknown data from before AGS 2.5. Okay. Um, and then we have these functions that are like read and write, and that's it. So what are we going to do with these dialogue topics? Presumably they're in some that pulled to us in the script directory. I guess we can't maybe get here from um, maybe it's not in this folder. Wait, what? I need to spell this correctly. Find references. Okay, so where do we use dialogue topic? We have engine AC dialogue. That might be interesting, although it's not. And we have uh, this implementation, the CPP file. And we have the main game file that refers to it. And that's really it. Maybe let's take a quick look at the CPP. There's really nothing not much here. You know, this is reminding me of, um, there's, a, um, there's a guy, Casey, and I forget his name. I think he's the same as the Handmade Hero guy who has this, um, this talk about uh, the difference between structuring your code for performance like you would do in a game engine and kind of structuring it for readability and, and like distributing essentially readability across like a, um, um, an organization. Um, and uh, one of the one of the differences between those two is that um, when you're when you're optimizing for like um, making your code maintainable and readable across an organization, you tend to break things down into like really small parts um, that can be uh, compo composed or combined, and often uh, in in uh, like. Java style, um, they can be extended by inheritance and those sorts of things. And the, to me, this so far that this code base reads a little bit like um, that's the that's the route they're going down. That all of the files seem very small. We have like a small number of methods, um, and it's it takes a while to kind of dig through all the things and find out where um, where the functionality is. That's my my uh, my initial sense, at least. All right, so let's see if we can find um, something with scripts. Because I know that I've seen it. Let's just try um, graphing. I don't have too many things about scripting. And I think this is a case sensitive graph, so let's try a script. Nevertheless, this is more promising. We have register script function, return script load file, and whatever serious.yaml is. Hmm. We're getting a bunch of hits in room file and some hints in reconstruct and the direction. So those were all things we already opened. So I guess what the world is telling me is that to understand scripts, 
Um, I should understand those things first. So let's see if I can find that buffer where I open these all. All right, so we look at the main game file. Let's look at um, room file. This unit provides functions for reading compiled room file. So maybe this is just for reading, we'll see, into the room stru structure, as well as extracting separate components, such as room scripts. So I guess the room file um, potentially will have scripts, the scripts that go on in each room. I guess it makes sense to store them with the room. If we're including functional, maybe we're doing some functional stuff. And we have this sprite info script struct that is where do we terminate? I feel like, I guess we terminate down below. This formatting is throwing me off a little bit. Um, it, I guess inside the, inside the, um, oh wait, did I say this was a struct? This is not a struct. This is a class. Yeah, oh no, no, sprite info is just terminated here. I got confused visually. Okay. All right, so we have this um, room file error type. These are just different errors, like I couldn't open your file, the data sucked, etc. Then we have a room file block, which has things like the main room data. So I'm guessing the, the uh, oh no, it's an it's an enum. Okay. So maybe this enum is telling us like we're saving the data in blocks. Is that is that what it means? Or or, or chunks essentially? And um, this is telling us what a what a particular chunk is as we're parsing it. Um, at any rate, it might be the main room data, it might be uh, script stuff, it might be old script stuff, and it might be room names, or backgrounds, and whatever contemporary compiled script means, and script names, the room objects. Okay, so we're just packing all this information, and I guess probably the reason this is an enum is that they're going to be used for parsing. Um, then we have the room data source. Open room header, etc. Okay, so we should be parsing them into a struct, right? Um, room struct. So let's look at room struct. That's I think what we really want. Is that what we just looked at? No. Here we go. Room struct. That's CPP. Okay, here we go. All right, and so we have options for each room. The room can have startup music. Uh, save load disabled. I don't know what that means. Save load. Maybe like you can save the state from a load as a, a loaded file. I mean, you can load the state from a state. Load the state from a saved file. Is it possibly what that means? Um, player character off. Maybe that's used for uh, like cutscenes. Player view. I don't know what player view might be. And then you can control the volume and, and maybe have some flags. You might share the palette with other rooms, I guess. This is a room background frame. And we're just going to call memset uh, of the palette. Uh, oh, I guess if we're not sharing the palette, we're going to just zero, zero out the palette, is basically what it's say. And then we have room edges. And left, right, top, bottom. I'm not sure. Um, if we're assuming that everything's a rectangle, then maybe these are essentially, uh, when you make a room edge, you're going to tell it um, uh, give, it a, give it a coordinate system by passing integers into those, into left, right, top, and bottom, perhaps. And then we have uh, room edges and room object info, which includes things like the sprite x and y. I don't know uh, what those are the x and y values of. Room <laughs> defaulting to negative 11, whether it's on. A baseline of flags. Room object info. I don't know what a room object is, whether it's an object in the room or something else. And we have a room region, which doesn't actually contain any information about the region itself. It just has whether it's light and, and its tint. And then a walk area, which has a character view, a scaling far and a scaling near. So maybe this is like, if you're like walking off into the distance um, to, to get the perspective right, if, as you're far away, your character gets smaller. Maybe that's what scaling far is. And then um, uh, in, in the, maybe in the mid range, you scale also, but not so much. And that would be, I guess, instead of having like a continuous 
uh, scaling factor for both. I'm not sure. Um, and whatever these pair, player view and character view things are, I, I'll look at them in a little bit, and then we have top and bottom for the walk area. But not left and right, right? I'm not sure. Walk behind. Um, I think I saw... So there's a, um, there's a video I watched of somebody putting together a basic game in Adventure Game Studio, and I think I remember Walk Behind... And I watched this um, like months ago, um, but I think that what I remember is that um, you can... Essentially, you know, let's say you create um, a desk or, or a piece of furniture, um, you can have the character walk behind it instead of in front of it. And the way you do it is you basically you, you toggle walk behind. So I think that that's what walk behind is for. Um, and then what else? We can freeze some stuff. Which is like, we finally get to a, um, an implemented function, it looks like. Room strike free. Um, and it's like the largest, <laughs> largest function we've seen. It's just resetting stuff. Um, free messages, free scripts, and then we have initial defaults. Uh, uh, and I don't know. Okay, so here we have it. This will tell us what edges is. Edges is 0, 317, 40, and 199. Yeah, so I think that these are somehow coordinates to the rectangle, probably in a straightforward way. Um, and then we have whatever a room hotspot is. I'm guessing a hotspot is maybe a place where you can click on, like, a, there's a player action. Let's see if we can find a hotspot. Yeah, that's where we already were. Wait, didn't I get a good definition? This is a CS file. I guess I'm guessing it's a C sharp from um, the lack of Emacs support for, for currently. Maybe room hotspot is defined in this file. Here we go. A room hotspot description. We've got a name, a script name, presumably the name of the script that is going to execute when the player like clicks on this hotspot or whatever. A spring IMAP, a string IMAP rather, which has got some way of some way of encoding properties, essentially um, configuration that that is flexible. Uh, we have old style interactions. Sounds like we've moved to some other new interaction system. And event script links. Uh, okay, so event scripts. I don't know how event scripts differ from regular scripts. And then the point to walk to, the player will automatically walk here when interacting with the hotspot. So I guess if your player is like, um, down, uh, I don't know, if you're here on this <laughs> like pedestal and you click on this machine, you're, presumably your player will walk over to the machine to try to touch whatever, maybe to touch some button or whatever. I'm guessing that's what walk to is for. Um, okay, so that's pretty straightforward. We have a hotspot, and it's going to have some script, and your player's going to walk somewhere. And that's mostly it. And then there's some configuration. Let's take a look at interactions. Interactions. And we are what? We're in C++. And we have this equals operator, which I guess is not so, um, so interesting. Is it interesting? We've got some list. We're going to resize it. And we're going to walk over. We're going to iterate over everything. And set events i, the interaction event, and i that events, and return this. Huh. Oh, this is, I guess this equals assignment as in equals equals. Okay. Um, copy times run. This will I guess run it for some number of times. Copy. Oh no no. Maybe we're just copying the number of times run. I don't know. I don't feel like uh, reading that poorly very carefully. Okay. So create from stream. So we can have some stream. I don't know what kind of type this is. Um, there's some class. Read bool protected. Write array of in eight. I guess it's essentially some array, um, an array of in eights that has some behavior. I'm guessing. Unless we're importing something. We're importing an IAG screen. The contract between for screen classes provided by the engine to plug in on the to plug in on the need, such as saving and restoring a game. Okay. 
So whatever strings are for is valid. Get length can write read uh, read in eight read in thirty two. So this is like um, reading and writing from various arrays. I guess uh, like a homegrown stream API is maybe the the way to think of this. All right. Anyway, we can create from a stream. And we're just going to do a bunch of reading and writing and setting up things. We can write to a stream. We can write the interaction to the stream. Uh, we still don't know what an interaction is. Write to save game. Read, write, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Interaction variable. Okay, so we've got um, this interaction variable thing, which has a type and a value. And we can create one and give it a name. You can read and write the interaction variables, and we can create them from streams. But what does it actually do? Huh. Is this all we get? Maybe we should have looked at the header. Interaction types. Most of the interaction types here were used before the script and have very limited capabilities. Okay, so it sounds like this framework um, of interactions predates scripting for Adventure Game Studio. And so this is the legacy, this is some legacy stuff which we've seen. Um, in the notes, the, the, uh, the comments in the other files. The way this works, we've got some interaction on a hotspot one, I guess, and some event types. I guess these are events that are, I don't know how we listen for events, but maybe we'll see that. And then, in, and then an interaction command list, like look at hotspot, like if it's a, uh, like look at door, I guess, or look at graffiti, if that, that's a hotspot. And then we've got um, each, I guess the interaction command list contains interaction commands. And then, I don't know what display message means. Um, oh, I guess when you look at the hotspot, it's going to display the message. Is that, what, that, is that what it's saying? And then we've got interaction values. Um, and we've got a list of them. And, uh, okay. And so we'll just take a quick look at this. Um, since scripting is so, um, in theory, like if you have a Turing complete script, there's no, there's no real structure to, to the scripting itself. So the reason I'm looking at this outdated interaction stuff is I'm curious to see if there's any structure here that, that tells us more about how you would want to think of adventure games. Now, naturally, whatever structure it has will be limited, but it will at least be some structure that will, that will possibly tell us something. Um, so we have this interaction command list that represents a list of commands or actions that need to be performed on particular game event. Okay, so we have uh, actions to run and some list of them. That's really it. What order they run or whatever, I have no idea. Doesn't seem the same in the documentation. Let's look at what type this interaction command is. Destruct. And we have things like just some integer type. Some arg a, I guess a list of arguments, some sub actions, a parent, and so we've got some sort of graph, I guess, and we can assign them. Okay, that's enough interactions for me, uh, and that's enough rooms for me. I think. Did we look at all the room stuff? The rooms can have hotspots. We've got some list of hotspots, list of reg regions, places you can walk. I think we saw a lot of that. All right, what else do we have? Where's my direct buffer? Was it in core, I think? No? Um, I think it was in game. All right, so that was the room file. I, look at, I think we looked at room struct. A class describing initial room data. Because of the imperfect implementation, there is inconsistency in how this data is interpreted at, at the runtime. Some of the data is never supposed to be changed at runtime. Another may be changed, but these changes are lost as soon as room is unloaded. The changes that must remain in memory are kept as separate classes. See room status, room object, etc. Partially, this is because the same class was used for both engine and editor. While, runtime, while the runtime code was not available for the editor. Okay. All right. This is kind of just like implementation, uh, implementation information, I guess. We've got room area masks, and 
I guess the masks are going to be um, like essentially some some bitmap. Um, maybe that's the whole. Or presumably the you know the size of the whole screen, and then the what you know the, it's a, it's zero in most places, and then it's one where the mask is active. Um, and so a hotspot mask would be uh, presumably one that has one only on the pixels that that are counted as the hotspot. I'm going to guess. Not positive. They could have done it in <laughs> some sort of crazy way. Um, we've got some volume modifier stuff, some flags for the room. I guess stuff about frame locking. I'm not sure. Um, is that cool? I don't know. And then you can have at most 50 hotspots in a room. I guess it would be a pretty intense adventure game that had more than 50 hotspots in a room. And um, you can have some max of objects, although I don't know if I. I don't know what counts as an object, because your drawing can have as many um, things on it as, as needed that aren't represented in code in any way, for example. And right, then we've got these room options, which I think we've seen. But now we get a definition of car off. The character is turned off in the room. All right. And then player view, we finally get a definition. Apply player character is normal view when entering this room. And then what's the other view? Wasn't there a character view? Yeah, okay, so uh, character view is a part of walk area. And a character view says, apply character's normal view. <laughs> area. Huh. How's that different from player view? Optimal provide for a player character view. I have no idea what this is supposed to be, but they're there. Then whatever a trap file is, this unit provides functions for reading compiled translation files. Okay, this is like translation stuff. Interactions, I think we looked at, right? So that's fine. Did you look at the CPP? I'm not sure. I don't think we really need to. Looks like lots of reading and writing. And then custom properties is probably not so important. Custom property schema is kept by game setup struct object as a single instance and defines property type and default value. Every game entity that has properties implemented keeps custom properties object, which stores actual property values only if ones are different from default. Okay, so custom properties. Um, all right, so that was common, right? We looked at four. Is there anything in graphics? We have bitmaps, um, whatever an Allegro, Allegro bitmap is. Allegro lib. Okay, there's some lib. Um, and we have a GUI. We have things like buttons. In, I don't know what in is. In the window, who knows, list boxes, main, these are just like um, point and click things, and we have a text box. I don't know how they're doing, uh, they implement their own GUI system? Let's take a look at GUI object. <laughs> we have things like get height. That's like the CPP file. I'm just trying to see if we if there's anything like they're using an existing kit. I'm not sure. Let's take a look at main. The header, I guess. Yeah, I don't see them importing anything like GTK or whatever. I guess you don't necessarily need that stuff. Um, but this kind of puts them in the business of uh, drawing things directly on screen. Is that what they want? Maybe it is. I don't know. That seems that seems harder than just um, building and maintaining a, an adventure game library. All right. So, what else is in common? We have lib source, which is third party stuff again, and then we have lib include, which is more third party stuff. Platform, just as Windows script. I don't think you've seen this one. The C script style compiler. Okay, so we're compiling the script. And we have huh, global num fix ups. I'm not sure what a fix up is. They're fixing some stuff up. And this looks like just a straightforward um, compiler stuff, like nothing uh, particularly video game specific. You can find any information about fix ups. Girl, fix ups. 
I don't really see anything that's super informative. A quick look. Let's move on. CC common script options and error reporting. Okay. So we have things like should we include the line numbers, um, stuff about configuring imports, and yeah, really not much. Okay, so that's good. Then we have tests. Tests are always good. And then utilities for things like compression, buffered streams, bebop, in case you want to listen to some music, I guess. Matrix this is maybe just uh, matrix map. Help our matrix functions to ease use of GLM in simulated 2D space. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's common. What do we have that's above common? We have compiler. Um, and I'm going to guess, based on what we've seen before, that this is going to be uh, not, this is going to be like implementing a pretty generic script that's not super uh, adventure game uh, specific. Um, so we have a compiler, we have a tree map, which is presumably kind of like a hash map implemented as a tree a symbol table, a macro table, etc. Uh, this is a C-style script pilot. Mimix original interface, but use a standard map for storage. Okay, so we're going to use standard map to store stuff, and maybe we're using map to implement a tree. You can find value, add entry, clear. Okay. So, is there anything here that's um, adventure gaming? I don't think so. All right. So the editor and the engine are presumably going to be edit, uh, adventure gaming, and then we have scripts. Scripts are apparent. They seem to be uh, scripts for um, managing the adventure game studio source code themselves, rather than like um, scripts for the games. I don't know what an SL. LN is solution file, the um, Visual Studio file format, I guess. This is like, uh, whoops. Yes, kill anyway. This is like uh, just essentially metadata to help the, the programmers work in their preferred environment. So we're left with editor and engine. And which one's cooler? I'm going to guess editor is cooler. We've got this plugin stuff. I'm an engine engine right now. We've got this. We had some plugin stuff. We've got um, script.h and script.cpp and runtime script value. I guess let's look at script.h and script.cpp. We have object event. A struct holds data of the object's interaction event, such as the object's inference, sorry, reference, and accompanying parameters. So this holds things like a pointer to the a pointer to the object and some um, parameters or arguments for it, I guess. An object event. The name of the script block to run may be used as a formatting string. Okay, so um, the block, I guess, has scripts like any... Sorry, the, the script has block like any other programming language. And I guess somehow they're named. Maybe you have to name the blocks when you write the script. I don't know. Um, we have an ID for the block. And then runtime script value, which is a dyn object. The dynamic object this event was called for, if applicable. An interaction mode. And what kind of modes do we have? I don't think this is graphics mode. Oh, it's just an int. What we want to do is look at mode nine. Here we go. All right. So we uh, the modes are I guess things you can be doing like walking, looking, talking, handing, hand, whatever hand is, um, use or pick up something. Okay. So those are the, those are the sorts of things that modes are. And we've got some default setup stuff. And we can run dialog requests with some parameters. Um, why is it request? I don't know. And when you request to run dialog, first they're going to stop playing the dialog. Um, wait, play that stop playing dialog at end is set to dialog running. Okay, so that seems to be some sort of state. 
Uh, and then we are going to run the script function, game inst, I don't know what game inst is, and we're going to get something from it, possibly a, a, the underlying pointer, a smart pointer. Um, we're going to pass in this dialog request thing, this is, I guess, um, the name of this sort of message that we're sending, perhaps, and then, and then some params. And then we have uh, essentially a state machine based based on the setting of stop dialog at end. And how does that get set? I'm not sure, but we set it here. And so now when we get down here, I guess we're expecting it to have changed. And based on the state, we're going to do various things like return negative two, return tval, which is I'm not sure how to interpret tval. We're going to subtract the, the dialog new topic from stop dialog at end, etc. So these have this has some return values that have some some sort of meaning that's not obvious to uh, on an, on an initial reading, but it's doing some sort of uh, attempting to to run a dialog. Um, you can run a script. We can run a function on a non-blocking thread. We call update script mouse coordinates. I guess that's telling the um, the script where the mouse is. Room changes was is set to play room changes. At least one implementation exists. It's set to false. Huh. <laughs> Not sure why you would do that. Um, and then we're going to run modules. Modules need a fork inst for this to work. So we're going to um, iterate over the, the script modules. And we're going to set module has function at the index i to whatever do run script func can't block module inst fork can't, etc. Huh. I'm not sure what this, uh, this code is doing. I find this um, style a little bit confusing to read. But that's that's all right. We'll keep plowing on. All right. And so we put, and now we're back in script.h. You can do things like run an interaction event where you pass in an interaction, some int, and some other stuff. Runs the object event using an old interaction callbacks type of event index, or alternately, um, check any index if previous does not exist. Is in tells if this was an inventory event. It has a slightly different handling for that. Return zero normally or negative one, telling of a game state change. Okay, so it's some kind of like callback thing whose behavior it seems like has changed over time, um, and you kind of got to have to pass in different things depending on wh which behavior uh, you want. You can also run interaction scripts, run blah blah blah. Then you've got this runtime script value stuff. Try to run a script function on a given script instance. I'm not sure what a runtime script value is. Do you look at this? It can be undefined. And then we have this i value pointer. I'm not sure what um, magger pointer is, maybe manager pointer in size. And I think we did see some of this. OK. So this is uh, more script stuff. That's fine. We have a script API. Maybe this will tell us something interesting about the structure of scripts. We can, we can print that. And what? OK. So this is, I guess, the, um, yeah. So we have a bunch of uh, ways the script can, I guess, call into C is really what this is doing. And we got call print out. We can assert object count stuff. We can assert various things, helper macros for script functions, asserting an internal, for internal mistakes, etc. Um, more printf stuff, calls to static functions. Important, please note the following. Historically, AGS compiler did not have proper void types and allowed to store the return value of void API function as an integer. Okay. Um, so you can call a function, I guess by passing it in my name, and then we have this weird void pn stuff. Um, I guess it's not weird. I guess one, the first thing is maybe the return type. Is that right? And the second thing is the parameter type, because this is, for example, pn2, and it's taking in 32 here. 
And so we're, um, this is just an, essentially, we have to make one of these things for every way that a script wants to call um, one of the functions, I guess, of the, of the um, AGS system that's in C or C++. All right, so that's script. Um, we also have media. That's probably not so important. I'm going to guess main is not so important. We have game run. Do we look at game run and game start? I mean, these are presumably going to do <laughs> bootstrap and stuff. Initialize, start, and gameplay. Uh, this is like set cursor mode to walk. I guess you begin as walking. If override start room. You might override the start room for some reason. Maybe for debugging. And you load the game. And you run game, I guess, until aborted. Basically an infinite loop that you can escape out of. Um, okay, engine setup, is that interesting? So engine, I think they're thinking of as the, um, just the interface with the graphics, because this seems to be all about graphics system stuff. And, uh, and that's fine. And then if for engine, we've got things for like support for devices. What is game? Game is like game, save games mostly, but also a viewport. And the viewpoint, I mean, we've got some stuff like cameras and viewports. I, they, I guess that makes sense. They, they were going to be somewhere. I'm not sure why they're in this folder in particular. And a camera has what? Camera defined a looking eye inside the room. It's position and size. It does not render anywhere on its own. Instead, it is linked to a viewport. And ladder draws what the camera sees. So this is the standard thing, I think, the, um, that you get in um, definitely in 3D software. Maybe also this is common in 2D software. We've got some uh, rectangle, that's the room camera position. And we can set the size, I guess, of the camera, uh, whether it's locked, we can release a locked camera. And then the viewport is just going to be the thing that is shown by the, um, by the camera. Where's the viewport? Last viewport here. Viewport to find the rectangular area on game screen where the contents of a camera are rendered. And you can only link one uh, camera to a viewport at a time, which makes sense, and it's basically just some rectangle and whether it's visible. All right. That's engine. And let's see. I think the last interesting thing is editor. Um, and we've got native, which should just be things like support for Windows or whatever. Scintilla, I forget what Scintilla was. We have some light things up. All tip, case convert. Is Scintilla font stuff? Did we look this up? Let's do Scintilla Linux. It's a free open source library that provides a text editing component function. Okay, so this is, I guess, for editing text. Presumably. Which you may need to do in your adventure game. Or maybe, it's, no, no, it's, I guess it's for the editor. So that you're like writing a script or whatever, you can do that in the, um, in the adventure game studio itself. References that text. Following assemblies must be included in this directory. So this is something about building. And then we have types, native. All ignore native. Um, we've got the script compiler controls. Let's look at controls, let's look at editor, let's look at types. Do types first. CS. So CS should be, um, is it C++? CS yeah, file extension. I mean, not C++, um, C sharp, right? Yeah, okay. Do we have a C sharp mode? So um, we've got like audio clip stuff, folders, basically where they're stored. Not a whole lot of um, interesting, I guess, uh, technical stuff. Things like build targets. The audio clip itself, is that interesting? Whatever i2xml is, convert something to xml. And directory, source file named, some identifiers, volume. I'm not sure what this, um, these are some sort of, I guess, annotations on functions in C sharp. I don't know. Uh, they kind of look commenty. And 
this is all kind of like where things are stored, where where can we get the files, etc. Uh, interactions. We've got a schema. I don't remember seeing an interaction schema. But maybe that's a thing. And again, this kind of seems like a lot of a lot of boilerplate. Right. That's not that is what I expected. That was what the types. Is there anything else in types? Maybe enums are interesting. Odd height, game scaling, log group, lip sync type. What are the different lip sync types? Palette colors, room. What was it? Room volume. Um, let's say a lip sync type. None, text, or Pamela voice files. Maybe Pamela is some way of synchronizing, um, encoding lip synchronization in a file, I guess. Constants, are constants interesting? A little bit. Different masks, right? Do you look at dialog? Uh, we've got a text parser, which you can possibly show. The dialog, we've got some scripts from the dialog script file. We have identifiers. Well, it could show a text box along with the options so that the user can type in custom text. And if you type in custom text, I guess you have to parse it. And maybe that's just done in the script. I don't know. All right, so that's types. Let's look at controls. And we get Scintilla stuff here, address bar stuff here, assembly info, and Scintilla helper. This all seems to be address bar and Scintilla related. Address bar extension, dot controls. There is some extra error handling, and most of the method that, in theory, is redundant. For performance reasons, you should remove a lot of the information. Okay. So controls doesn't seem like the, um, the most cool thing. And here's the editor. And we get things like entities, uh, enums. Let's see what an entity is. A multi-select action. Log buffer gets script editor control and then args. Editor preferences, speech lip sync line, recently edited game, uh, zoom to file event. Okay. So these are all, um, uh, they, they seem like everything in there kind of is legitimately there to support the UI um, rather than uh, something uh, specifically adventure gaming. We have play finished handler which can do things like play, check whether it's playing, poll, presumably poll the thing that's playing stuff and see if something else is playing maybe, get length and get position, and stop and resume, etc. Okay. Then we have uh, panes, plugins, properties, resources. Tasks. What's a task? Have you seen tasks? Instruct basic file list for template. Create a new game from template. Maybe a task is like a, you know, like a script. Load game from disk. Yeah, these things that are tasks look uh, basically like um, uh, oper scripted operations. All right. Is that it? That seems to be, all, that seems to be it. I kind of feel like... Um, I don't know if it's just the, um, the way the code is structured, but it kind of seems hard for me. Uh, I feel like I, I feel like I'm missing something uh, right now with uh, with what Adventure Game Studio is doing. But I guess um, I guess maybe it really is all there. So let's go back and look at an example of just here, and let's see if we can find a higher resolution. Screenshot. Let's just try Adventure Game Studio. And choose a large one. Oh, are there any wallpaper size Adventure Game Studio screenshot? I don't I don't know that these are actually of the thing. Of the all right. So here's a here's a slightly more higher resolution screenshot. So all of these dialog stuff that will be in the folder we just saw. And um, I guess if the if the uh, if the, yeah the making of the of the game itself is, is I guess pretty straightforward, right? Once things are set up, um, once you have the right model for how to do it, I'm sure there are lots of um, hard ways to build an adventure game where you kind of get tangled up 
and knots and everything. Um, but you're going to just have a series of bitmaps in this uh, like older style game. Um, and each bitmap will have masks, and we've seen uh, we've seen that in the code. And then those masks are going to select regions. And um, when you go over that region and you click on it, your character will move probably there. Typically, in the typical case, they might move somewhere else. Um, and you will execute some sort of script. And that script can, I guess, in theory, be anything that you can express in. Uh, something like C or Lua, uh, confined to the limitation that uh, the number of, uh, like the library functions you can use are the ones provided by uh, by Adventure Game Studio. And um, as you build out the game, you're going to build up this graph of, um, of rooms. And, and the that graph, I think, we, we saw at least some of the stuff related to, to how that graph is stored. Um, and I don't know if there, there doesn't seem to be, at least uh, as I'm looking at it, a way to uh, encode like a puzzle. Like a lot of it in adventure games, you'll have to you know get the piece of paper from the guard and show it to the king, and he'll give you a scepter or whatever. Um, I don't see that explicitly, those sorts of puzzles explicitly modeled. Um, and maybe they're, they're just implicitly modeled by how you um, code up the interactions and the scripts. But, um, but I, I think like you can look up like a puzzle dependency graph. Here's, is it, this purports to be one. I don't know what game this is. But basically you should get some sort of DAG, right? Whatever the dig is. Uh, Monkey Island, I think. Oh, no, Scab Island. How about Monkey Island? Let's see if there's anything like this. All right. Um, I don't know. I've never played this game. I don't know if, any, if these are puzzles. I don't think there are any spoilers. And certainly, I don't think you can read any of the text. Um, but there will be some sort of like dependencies, actually, maybe. Okay, so whatever envelope is. So envelopes, they, there's some things with bananas and organs. And if you have, I guess, a banana and a metronome, you can do more stuff. Um, and so that's how I think that people who design adventure games often think about them. And this, I guess, isn't doesn't seem to be represented in the code. I'll do a search for puzzle just to see if it is. But um, this might be something that you would want in your uh, adventure game editor if you were if you were really into making adventure games. Um, but that being said, maybe it's sufficient to to just do that uh, in some um, like vector graphic charting tool. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in the game engine. So let's look for puzzle. Literally no matches. Okay. And then uh, I'm just doing it a second time to make sure that I correctly told it I wanted told Emacs that I wanted um <laughs> yeah okay all right so um so that's gonna be it that's adventure game studio um I think it'd be fun to for if you're interested in games this should be a relatively uh, constrained and straightforward way to to make a game it might not be the the greatest game ever created but if, I think if you can write a story um and you can draw things or conjure up drawings of things using AI. This might be a fun way to, to spend a few hours um, making, making something that people can play. So that's all for me. Thanks for watching.